Coming up on the program, new Russian ceasefire proposal to evacuate civilians to Russia and Belarus branded immoral by Ukraine. Delegations from Ukraine and Russia hold third round of ceasefire talks. Plus, Russia no-show at International Court of Justice hearings on Ukrainian war. A warm welcome to the program this hour. I'm Millicent Walker. A lot has been happening the last few hours between Ukraine and Russia, but at least there is more talks from the Russian side. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov this afternoon said he is expected to meet his Ukrainian counterpart, Dmitry Kuleba, in Antalya, Turkey. It comes as a third round of talks is also expected to be held between negotiators from both countries today. It also follows the Russian government's announcement announcement of a humanitarian ceasefire and Ukraine's rejection. Here's Mon day 12 of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Russia's defense ministry this morning announced that six humanitarian corridors will be opened around Ukrainian cities to allow civilians to escape from Kyiv to Homel, from Mariupol to Zaporozhye and Rostovodon from Karaki to Belgorod, and from Sumy to Belgorod and Poltava. Of the four cities mentioned, only the smaller ones, Mariupol and Sumy, have evacuation routes that lead to other parts of Ukraine. Russia says the military will carry out uninterrupted objective control of the evacuation, including with the use of drones. But Ukraine's Deputy Prime Minister Irina Voroshuk said the humanitarian corridors are still not up and running, even though Ukraine rejected the proposal, condemning it as unacceptable, saying our people will not go from Kyiv to Belarus to then be flown to the Russian Federation. Voroshuk has called on the US, UK and France for assistance in establishing the corridors. President Zelensky's spokesperson says Ukrainian citizens should be allowed to leave their homes through Ukrainian territory. President Volodymyr Zelensky has asked the international community to boycott Russian oil, oil products and other exports. He's called for military aircraft to help defend his country and urged a boycott of supply to Russia. Meanwhile, Ukrainians continue to flee the fighting in droves to Romania, to Germany, and to refugee camps in Poland. The EU says as many as 5 million Ukrainians are expected to flee the country if Russia's bombing continues. It says the EU must mobilize resources to help countries receiving people. <laughs> British military analyst Ed Arnold says Russia's advance through Ukraine could be unsustainable within about three weeks due to military losses. Overall, uh, Russians continue uh, to advance on their axes, uh, however it is slow. Uh, within the north, they are still looking to uh, fully encircle Kiev. Um, the Ukrainian counterattacks that we've seen on the west of Kiev over the last couple of days, um, the Russians seem to have taken that ground back now. Uh, over in the northeast, again, they're moving to encircle Kharkiv and also starting to move their forces to the west and to the south. The real risk uh, at the moment is for the Ukrainian anti-terrorist organization forces in the east, that if troops, Russian troops can move south, and then north from the southern direction, they could potentially cut off the forward line of Ukrainian troops. In another development, Russia boycotted hearings at the International Court of Justice, during which Ukraine is seeking an emergency order to halt hostilities, arguing that Moscow has falsely applied genocide law in justifying its invasion. Hearings began at the ICJ without legal representation for Russia. His Excellency Mr. Alexander V. Shulgin, Ambassador of the Russian Federation to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, indicated that his government did not intend to participate in the oral proceedings. 
President Vladimir Putin has said Russia's special military action is needed to protect people who have been subjected to bullying and genocide, meaning those whose first or only language is Russian in eastern Ukraine. Ukraine says the claim is baseless and that the alleged genocide in eastern Ukraine was non-existent. The case centers on the interpretation of a 1948 treaty on the prevention of genocide signed by both countries. It names the ICJ as a forum for resolving disputes between signatories. Meanwhile, more from the International Court of Justice today. Ukraine says Russia will have to listen to the orders of the ICJ, even though it boycotted the hearing of Ukraine's case, demanding an emergency order to stop the hostilities. The parties will be advised in due course as to the date on which the court... The purpose of the war, he said, was to protect people from genocide. This is a horrible lie. Putin lies, and Ukrainians, our citizens, die. It is not Ukraine who commits genocide. It is Russia and its political leadership and military personnel who commit crimes against humanity and war crimes on the territory of Ukraine. Well, for more on the situation on ground in Ukraine, we have joining us Anna Chenikova from Ivano Frankivsk, Western Ukraine. Hello, Anna. Uh, first, give us a picture of how it's been for you, uh, for all of you, throughout the night and now. Uh, uh, well, uh, the West, uh, where I am located at the moment, uh, well, here is quite fine for now. Nothing is happening. Um, we have a big, again, uh, the most difficult situation is in the east and uh, in the south. Uh, so the Kherson, the city of Kherson is occupied. And the city of Mykolaiv is fighting very hard. Um, the city of Kharkiv is fighting very hard, but we have humanitarian uh, catastrophe there. and. Uh, they demand uh, the demand immediate uh, corridor, a humanitarian corridor to get civilians out. Same similar situation is in Mariupol, and uh, similar situation is in the Kharkiv region, in little towns in Kharkiv region. Uh, the city of Kyiv is fighting uh, as well, ready to fight. Uh, Kyiv region is fighting very hard, uh, also trying to evacuate civilians, but unfortunately, Russian troops do not let uh, any humanitarian operations go. Um, nevertheless, some people have been evacuated under the shellings. Um, so situation is difficult, situation is tough, but people remain positive. Interesting. Um, Anna, as well, on the issue of the humanitarian corridor, first, is that the case uh, from some of the cities you've mentioned? And what are you hearing? Because there are reports that shellings are still ongoing in those areas. Shellings are ongoing. Uh, the, it was no break, unfortunately, for people, especially for the civilians who remained there. Yesterday, uh, the whole family was killed in Irpin, its Kyiv region. Uh, they were killed by the Russian well, rockets uh, when they were trying to evacuate, uh, to get out of the city during this uh, time period uh, that was agreed. So uh, the humanitarian corridor had a certain period agreed, but unfortunately, Russians didn't let, didn't let people out. Um, so today, uh, we again, we had a hope that this would happen, but once again, uh, Russians didn't let people out from Mariupol, from Irpin, uh, from Kharkiv. So we're still waiting for any advances on that. And, and we also know over the weekend, previous ceasefire attempts uh, collapsed and Ukraine is calling, um, uh, dismissing Russia's latest announcement as immoral. Um, speak to us as to the talks um, that would be going ahead today, uh, ceasefire talks. Well, it's always hope. So we definitely hope that at least humani humanitarian aid would be agreed and humanitarian care 
corridors would be agreed and would be provided finally. So this is the main hope for now because really uh, people are on the edge and uh, some towns, some cities really need an immediate evacuation. Um, in terms of ceasefire, uh, in general, well, there is a li very little hope. So we don't really know what's going to happen today, what the talks will end up with. Uh, we are waiting for the results. We are waiting at least for humanitarian decision. Indeed, a lot of hope. Um, but it's day 12 of this invasion and we know there's still millions of people who are still, um, I mean, in the country. What's the situation in terms of uh, food, uh, water and other supplies? Um, a lot of people left uh, to the west, so west part of Ukraine uh, where the situation is okay for now, uh, there is not really a problem with any food or water or uh, any um, medic medication, so the situation is fine. Uh, if we talk about uh, cities uh, with active uh, hostilities, um, those that I've already mentioned and you've already mentioned, the situation is terrible. It's no food, no electricity, no water, no heating, and uh, people are surviving. But I, I really honestly don't know how long could they actually uh, go on like that. So. Um, we only have, uh, in the city of Kyiv also for, for the moment, no problem with food or water. So a lot of um, humanitarian support is going from the civilians. Uh, people are united in this and uh, a lot of organizations and the private civilian organizations as well. They provide all the, all the needed um, products and um, medications. So uh, the only problem that uh, it is impossible to get all this to the areas where people need it very much. So be because, again, of, uh, of, of the humanitarian corridors which were not allowed. And Anna, in terms of where you are, are you seeing more people leave each day? Uh, how much more people are you seeing? Uh, we're hearing uh, 1.5 million over that number who have uh, left um, in terms of uh, uh, the, the war there in Ukraine. Yeah, officially over 1 million people have already left uh, the country. For the moment, borders are not that busy as they were a couple of days ago. So. Um, why is most that? Of people who want, well, most of people who wanted to leave, they already left. Uh, a lot of people don't want to leave and they stay in the West or they stay in the central part of Ukraine and they hope uh, and wait for the moment to come back home. So not, not everyone wanted to leave the country. And does that include women and children? Uh, yes. Uh, a lot of women and children, they stay in the West, um, not leaving the country, uh, even though out of that million, uh, 1.5 um, uh, million people, uh, mostly there are um, women and children, but a lot of them, they stay in Ukraine. In terms of the number of casualties, civilian casualties, um, do we know the, what the numbers are now? Uh, for the, late, late, the, late in, the latest information was over 2,000. So over 2,000 civilians and uh, all, uh, over 40, uh, no, not 40, I'm sorry, 38 children. This is what we know so far. These are really um, uh, terrible and sad figures uh, we're hearing. Um, in terms of the, the morale of those on ground, those who are saying that they have decided to fight, they're not going anywhere, um, this really must be trying times. But then um, they're also speaking to you. I mean, how determined are they? And do you think that they will see this through? People want to fight and want to get Russians out as soon as possible. This is 
uh, in general uh, situation in Ukraine and um, uh, the mood, the spirit in Ukraine. So uh, people are remaining in the towns as much as they can. They help as much as they can. So some people take uh, weapons and protect uh, within territorial defense or within uh, Ukrainian army. Uh, some people help with humanitarian support, some people help with informational support and uh, um, just locating people and helping refugees. So people are extremely united these days. The nation is extremely united and the nation is ready to fight until the very end. And uh, as I already said, people are very positive about, the, about their victory at the end. So. Anna Chernikova from Ivano Franksik, uh, Western Ukraine. Thanks so much and continue to stay safe. Thank you. In the meantime, the mayor of Ukrainian town of Irpin near Kyiv says the evacuation of civilians are proceeding. Alexander Makushin says today's evacuation was peaceful and about 1,000 people were taken to safety. But he says Russian forces continue to shell Irpin. He says Ukrainian forces have repelled attacks by Russian forces who have pulled back to the edge of the town. An advisor to the interior minister says other towns to the northwest, including Bucha, Hostomel and Vorzel, are now controlled by Russian forces and the situation remains critical. It's like a disaster. The city is almost ruined and the district where I'm living, it's like no houses which were not bombed. Yesterday there was the the hardest bombing and like you know the lights and the sound is so scary and the whole building is shaking and I and my children we were sitting like half of night in the doorway because it's like the safest place and I decided that it's, we walked on foot and actually there was a man who helped our family and drive, drove us here and he told that his family were killed and he is helping refugees. So I can't say that I'm a refugee. Actually, I'm quite a prosperous woman with a flat, but now it's absolutely not important. What is important is that my My feeling is that uh, I'm afraid about tomorrow. I'm not afraid about now. Most of all, I'm afraid about tomorrow. What will happen in Ukraine next? What's the next day? What's our future here? We have here our families, we have here our business, we have here all our life. It's, it's built it here. I'm living seven years in Ukraine, I have built a good life here and now I don't know what's my future, what's tomorrow, what's going to happen. It's really, we are lost, we don't know what we are doing. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken says the United States has a sacrosanct commitment to NATO's Article 5 guarantee of mutual defense between member states. NATO countries have ramped up their presence in the Baltic nations in recent weeks and more troops and equipment are on the way, policymakers have announced. Speaking in Lithuania, Blinken says NATO is continuously looking at extending troop deployments in the region and increasing the number of permanent deployments. The United States commitment to Article 5, an attack on one, is an attack on all. That commitment is sacrosanct. And as President Biden repeated to the American people in his State of the Union address uh, just a few days ago, we will defend every inch of NATO territory if it comes under attack. No one should doubt our readiness. No one should doubt our resolve. We're continuously reviewing within NATO our uh, defense posture. Uh, including looking at questions of um, uh, extending uh, the deployment of forces, uh, looking at questions of uh, more permanent deployments. All of that is under regular review and we're engaged with, uh, with NATO allies uh, in doing just that. Joining us right now is a security analyst, Mr. Chidi Nwanu. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me. Tidi, tell us, um, I mean, at what point does one break a ceasefire, seeing what we saw over the weekend and what we're hearing, which was supposed to uh, kick off and isn't, uh, and this is according to, it depends on who you're listening to, different reports. 
Sorry, I missed the question. So the question is, tell us exactly at what point there is a break or, I mean, they've, they agreed to a ceasefire, and this is over the weekend um, on Saturday. And then we heard that it lasted or it didn't last at all um, because the Ukrainians accused the Russian of continuing with their shelling. So, and this is depending on who or you're listening to. Some people are saying the Russians uh, breached that, others are saying no, that wasn't the case. So at what point, you know, does one break uh, such a ceasefire in a time like this, this war? So I think the, the key thing we have to understand is that we're dealing with a live combat situation and there's several things that could have gone wrong. The first is that it was never a genuine ceasefire in the first place and the Russians had no intention of uh, honoring it. There are several factors that lead one to believe that uh, the first is that, you know, their second offer of a ceasefire is withdrawing uh, Ukrainian civilians through Russia and Belarus, which is essentially a non-starter for most Ukrainians. And the second being that, you know, from people I've spoken to on the ground, um, that we tried to leave during the ceasefire. They were fired upon by Russian forces and Russian tanks blocked the road. Uh, but that could also be a breakdown in communications. We've seen so far that the Russians have not got as professional and as a high-quality military as we thought. So it is just as possible that the Russian uh, leadership wanted a ceasefire, but they hadn't been able to communicate that accurately to their troops on the ground, which is why it broke down in the end. So in terms of what Russia said, um, you know, you can have the option of going to Russia or Belarus. Um, do you think this is uncommon? Uh, is there something else at play uh, for Russia here? So it's, uh, this is one of the things that makes me uh, kind of think that maybe there isn't a genuine uh, intention for a ceasefire. This is more uh, a negotiating tactic or what would Paul Maskarovska in, uh, in the old days. Because no Ukrainian would want to withdraw through um, or be evacuated into Belarus or Russia. Yeah. So, and the Russians know this. So the only reason that they make this offer is so that the Ukrainians refuse and then they'll be accused of being unreasonable. So that would give you an indication that the Russians are fairly confident that they've got, uh, that they're you know, in the ascendancy uh, and just wish to keep prolonging the war until they've achieved their military objectives. Uh, and Chidi, we're hearing daddy, daddy, sorry, uh, we're cutting into your family time uh, with the kids. But then 12 days of this invasion and Russian troops have made significant advances, but they've so far failed to take the capital. Um, are you surprised by how Ukrainian forces have helped their own so far? Well, so we, the loss of, um, of Kiev would have been catastrophic to the Ukrainians at the, you know, at the outset, which was the uh, Russian objective to capture Kiev, uh, or at least to capitate the government straight from the get-go. They weren't able to do this. Now, this factor has helped you know, uh, the Ukrainians boost their morale as well as um, you know, help their forces put them all around the country. So the fall of Kiev is not necessarily a major military objective for the Ukraine for the Russians. It's now that they've not been able to do it in the first few days. The siege of Kiev is now the next objective, and creating that kind of spectacle where the Ukrainians are facing the difficulty as to whether they hold their capital or they hand it back. Finally, do you think this assault is going according to um, Russian president's plan? Uh, very broadly. Uh, and militarily, yes and no. Uh, so this, this is not a really good answer. So yes, in that, inevitably, the Russians will win this phase of the war, the conventional phase. They have the forces, they have air superiority, they have uh, the numbers and artillery uh, to, you know, dominate the Ukrainians. It's not going according to the plan, the strategic plan, which is a collapse and the capitation of the Ukrainian government. You've seen that the Ukrainians have rallied around their president, even, you know, his opponents who be defeated as, you know, supporting him. Even Russian speakers, ethnic Russians, are supporting the Ukrainian president in an independent Ukraine. So in that phase of it, strategically, uh, the Russian president will not achieve his objective. Even when he defeats the Ukrainian military and even if he causes the Ukrainian government to fall, there will be an insurgency which will lead Russia to the fall. And when you add to that the crippling economic sanctions, this is an unwinnable war for Russia. And it's very unclear how they're going to get themselves out of it. Security analyst Chidi Wano, many thanks for sharing your expertise with us on the program. Thanks for having me.
And as many people continue to flee for their lives in Ukraine, some Nigerians have been able to move into different border countries. Many have been evacuated from Poland, Romania and Hungary. But many have also crossed into Slovakia, according to the president of Nigerians in Slovakia, Josi Tinodube. According to him, the diaspora organization NIDO is helping Nigerians in collaboration with the Nigeria embassy in Vienna to make sure that the students are back home safe. The war has really impacted us, and uh, we are doing all we can with uh, the Slovakian uh, government and also Nigeria Embassy, NIDO, as, the, as an organization, NGO, to help, uh, uh, to help uh, Nigerians and other foreigners get back to, to our shore in Slovakia. Yeah. For foreigners, I know 26,000, but if you include it with Nigerians, about 333 Nigerians uh, flow into Nigeria, in, into um, uh, Slovakian border. Yeah, I would say it has been joined effort in the first place when we started. Uh, we were able to help uh, about 31 Nigerians uh, travel to Nigeria, uh, travel to Vienna, uh, to, uh, to Nigeria, and some of them have called us and they thanked us in collaboration with their parents. But later, the Nigerian embassy come in, they come into um, uh, to Slovakia and we had some meetings with them. They met most of the students and they educate them and they talk to them. They were able to share the information and be also helping them to make sure that all of them got back to Nigeria. And I know that uh, as I'm talking to you right now, uh, we have more than three badges already in Nigeria. Uh, what we have been doing, even the Nigerian embassy was here last time, last I think four days ago, or five days ago. And what we did was we gathered the Nigerian students and we were educating them, trying to make them, the first step the government was trying to do is to motivate them that they should go back to the country and the government is there to help them. And the government has to place adequate assistance for them to go back to Nigeria and how they can be able to motivate them because they know exactly what is happening. And we also, yeah, working with other NGOs, we are doing all we can uh, to help Nigerians also to motivate them. Also. But we also know, make no mistake, we also know that some Nigerians don't want to go, but we are doing all we can to educate them so that they can be able to get back to our country. Our country is a nice place to be. In Somenia, the front line enclosed to the Russian border in the northeast of the country. A group of Nigerian students from Sami State University are appealing for help and for a ceasefire to be declared so they can make their way out of the country. There are reports of no food in the market, bank cash machines not working, and the students are drinking melted snow after running out of water. Many Nigerians are also reportedly still stranded in Kherson, a city south of Ukraine, and the first major urban centre to fall since Moscow invaded. We speak to some of those Nigerian students still stranded right now. We have joining us to Lashe Kolapo Bello, who is in Somi, Ukraine. Uh, I believe we will soon be joined by Jerry Kenny, who is in Kherson. Uh, thank you to Lashe for joining us on the programme. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, speak to us about the situation where you are, Sami. Well, we are at this point, we are depressed, we are traumatized from all these bomb blast effects that has been happening in our city and we've been crying out for help. Today is day 11 or 12 now and we can hardly sleep at night because we don't know when next the bomb blast is flying over our head or happening and sometimes we spend it in bunkers and which is quite cold because it is currently two to three degrees outside and sometimes it has snowed and we've been crying out for help for them to evacuate us for us to be able to reach borders to go home but there's been no help rendered our way and stores have run out of food stops we literally have to ration our foods now just for it to be able to go around us and people will have to like melt snow and boil snow just because we've run out of drinking water and also people are falling sick due to the coldness of the bunkers and where we are sleeping so it's been peaceful, peaceful and we've been crying out to the school and the federal government to come and rescue us and come and save us but we've just been met with several disappointments, disappointments upon disappointments every day and nothing is being done.
they will tell us, they will carry it in the news that this is what is happening and nothing is being done. We are over 358, we are over 300 to Nigerian students stuck in Sumi with no way out. And we are still stuck. Nothing is being done. And we are crying out for help today that come and rescue us. We, are, we want to go home. We don't want to die in a foreign land. We are scared. We've been traumatized from the effect of bomb blasts. Some of us that are almost done with school, we don't know what to do next because we are almost done. And then we have just few, some people have few months to graduate. And this bomb effect has affected their mental health. I can begin to imagine uh, what you and all the other students are going through. But Tuluashe, what are the school authorities saying in terms of, uh, you know, the talks of the partial ceasefire, which, you know, we keep hearing, the humanitarian corridor? They, they told us that there, there are discussions about Green Corridor being opened onto us, but they've been um, keeping us in suspense, right? And they, they've been saying they're working with the federal government to do something about it. But the suspense is just there. They will tell us, okay, tomorrow, like they gave us hope that they will come and evacuate us today, that there will be green, there's, there's green corridor open on to us, only for us to wake up this morning and there is no bus for evacuation. And then we are hearing that there is no green corridor and it is not safe for us to leave after they promised us that they were going to evacuate us today. And it gave made people go into depression from that because they had hopes of going home today. So they've just been telling us that, oh, there, there's something happening, I mean, there's something that they will give us promises and they will fail eventually. That is how it has been going on. So to talk to us about perhaps other students who are with you, uh, with the Nigerian students, and what you think maybe their foreign, uh, other foreign students, what their government is doing for them at this time. Yes, concerning that, Indian, Indian government sent about, there were about three buses that came to evacuate them, which I saw with my physical eyes today. Well, and then today. we are hearing from the federal government. Yes, three buses that came to evacuate um, Indian students today that I saw with my physical eyes. And the federal government is telling us they are sending buses. They've been sending buses for how many days now and nothing has reached that side. For how long is bus going to reach? They said they'll reach out to Red Cross to escort us. For how long is that going to happen? Indians, even Chinese, have, have looked for ways to evacuate their students and they've been making efforts, but nothing has come from the federal government of Nigeria. Uh, also, uh, Tolu Ashe, you talked about food being rationed. Um, can you explain that further to us, uh, seeing as you're saying the supplies are really falling low? Sorry, I didn't get to repeat. In yourself. terms of the food ration, uh, you were talking about how supplies are now very low and you're rationing food. Uh, they're rationing food for you. So are we looking at a day or once a day or um, a day in between? It's not even about a day. It, like most times, we we'll just get food stops. There's been donations and funds given to Nigerian students. So we would get food stops for Nigerian students and tell them, okay, if we look for stores that have food and the moment we get it for them, we tell them, that, okay, manage it for as long as you can so that at least two to three days, we'll try and restock for them. On a normal day, my drinking water lasts me for two weeks, right? But the water, the level at, at which I've taken it now is the level that I would have taken it in one week, right? So like I've made my water to last for so long because their water is not pure yet. So and drinking their tap water can cause like all this skin and all these infections. If so I have to ration my drinking water and drink little by little and also my cooking of food. I don't cook as much quantity and I don't eat as much quantity because we don't know when stores are going to be stocked back. We don't know when food stores are going to be supplied to the city. All right. And even that, and we have lack of water. So there okay. was a time we ran out of electricity and there was power outage and some people could not bath for two to three days. You can imagine that I'm not being able to bath and some, some women have to take care of themselves. For two to three days, we could not bath. We could not even reach our parents. Our parents were concerned because there was power outage for some days and some people had to trek in the snow just to be able to find somewhere to charge their phones or somewhere to get water just because of their safety. 
these uh, harrowing situations. Tolu, hold the thought. Uh, we also have some Nigerians who are in Kherson, um, a city we understand has fallen uh, to Russia. Uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry Kenny. Jerry, um, welcome to the program. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. good evening, Jerry. Tell us, I mean, when people hear Kherson has fallen to Russians, they're wondering, uh, you're a Nigerian, what are you still doing there? <laughs> Definitely, uh, it's not my choice to stay here. Uh, for Kherson itself, is uh, along the southern part of um, Ukraine. Kherson has been taken, as, I, as, as we speak. Kherson has been taken. And um, it's very dangerous because we cannot even ply the road. The railway has been taken. The railway is now the means for transportation of tanks, um, heavy equipment for the Russians because it's close to Crimea. And uh, the, the other aspect which would have been a way out for us, which is the bridge that leads us straight to uh, Malitipo has been blown up. Now we have only one option, which is the Nikolai. Before we exit Kesson to Odessa, Kiev, we need to apply through Nikolai. Nikolai is seriously on attack now. And after this afternoon, I was speaking to Matthias this afternoon, and he heard the sound, the bomb sound. It was terrible. And it's not something that we, we need to uh, nail back for this. This is real. This is reality. We stay under the bunk, and it's very cold. Some people that you heard left Kesson, even in my, in, my, in my area now, are those people that were on board. I mean, Sifera, those people are on board. So for we that were, that were in Kesson at that, that, that point, we are all stuck. Over 100 of us were here. Some people are finding ways to escape by themselves. They keep telling you this will happen today. Tomorrow, we call the embassies. They tell you, get to the border. How are we going to get to the border? That's the, that's the big question for us. Mm. Because the road very, 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 very terrible. We try escaping. We, we took a, a taxi, six, um, six, four of us in a taxi for $1,300. A taxi will take for less than $50, one person. Mm. We have to take it for $1,000. Driving like 10 minutes, 10 minutes before we approached uh, Nikolai, we saw some uniform men. They point at us, 60 meters ahead, not saying anything, told us, to turn back. So after we escaped that, nobody wants to try that again. Look mm -hmm. at what the Indians did. Indians spoke with um, Putin and Zelensky to cease fire. They brought their bosses. They evacuated their people. From Kirsten as so, well, Jerry. No, not in Kesson. They were not able to enter Kesson because Kesson was captured. Kesson is close to Crimea, which is being um, occupied by the Russians. So I heard that I was like, okay, if we could have support like this, we want to go. We want to leave this place. It's terrible here. It's scary. You can't sleep at night. And, and Jerry, also, um, how many other students are with you? Or Nigerians okay, for, in person who want to leave? Okay, for Nigeria, in, not in Kethon, in general, in my own um, location now, Nigerians are 15. We are over 100 plus. We are over 150. But different location. There was a group chat that was created from different um, country. We are over 200 plus. But for Nigerians in my in my in my location right now, we are 15 Nigerians in my location. The aspect is this: you know, for for we seafarers, we are not much. But for uni students that are studying in a university, a lot of courses they are much because we go in and out. We go for practice, so our career is not too much. We don't have too much congested people here. But for other universities that students study, they are much. But for the seafarer, we are not too much. We are just for here, we are just like 15 seafarers, which are willing to evacuate if there is possible means for us to evacuate. And Jerry, in terms of supplies, how are you getting them? Sorry, again? In, in terms of supplies, uh, food, water, what's happening? Okay. Okay, for, for us, um, the, the Maritime Union, the Maritime Union, uh, they are taking care of the Maritime students. I don't know about any other university, but as far as UIC Fera, we have a union. So, and in conjunction with the, uh, with the academy that is uh, in charge of this Maritime 
um, students. They are making all possible best to ensure that we have our meal. But it's not like what we expect. You get what I'm saying? But the problem is not the food. The problem is not the water. If we can live here, we have a better life more than this. But you don't have an option. What you just want, once they give you, uh, serve you with a saucer plate for, 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 for meal, you, you, don't have, you don't have to say anything. Other people need to eat too. So. But we, I don't have anything with that. My own is to leave this place. A lot of people are waiting for us at the border. Any border, your friends are waiting. The companies are waiting. They are waiting for us to just arrive. If the government can just take us here, I don't have any problem. If they can just take us to the border, definitely most of us will find our way out. If we can afford a taxi of $1,300, then we can actually take a flight if the government is not ready to evacuate us from the border to Nigeria. But what we want now is to leave these zones. We need to evacuate these zones. It's dangerous for us. I want to believe that the federal government is listening to this cry uh, of help from students who are uh, Nigerians who are stuck in some of these cities. Kirsten, Sami, uh, Tolu, uh, your final words, and this is, you know, um, to the, the federal government, if they're they hoping that they are listening, what would it be um, from, from what you're going through? What would be your final uh, message to the federal government? Um, my final message to the federal government is please, we want to come home. Our parents are missing us. They can't sleep at night. They are having blood pressure because they are concerned about their children stuck here in Sumi. We just want to go home. We are still students. All we came here was for a better education was to study and come home and practice. And now this war has caused challenges for us. So we are crying out to everyone that is hearing us that please, we just want to come home and be able to sleep well. I've not slept, I can't say I've slept peacefully for six hours for the past 11 days without being scared of a bomb. So I just want to come home, that's all. Tolua Lashe Kolapo Bello is in Somi, Ukraine, and Jerry Kenny in Kherson. Thank you very much, both of you, um, for taking time out to talk to us. And this is hoping that the federal government is listening and will uh, do something quickly to rescue Nigerians and students uh, from that situation there in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Well, staying with Nigeria and its response, the federal government says its attention has been drawn to an alleged ongoing registration of Nigerian volunteers into the fighting uh, force of Ukraine at the Ukrainian embassy in Abuja. In a statement released, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs says it contacted the embassy to verify the speculation and the Ukrainian embassy refuted the allegation but confirmed that a number of Nigerians had approached the embassy indicating their willingness to fight on the side of Ukraine in its ongoing conflict with Russia. Furthermore, the embassy clarifies that the Ukrainian government is not admitting foreign volunteer fighters and as such dissociates itself from the claim that it is requesting $1,000 uh, from each Nigerian volunteer for air ticket and visa. The statement further adds that Nigeria discourages the use of mercenaries anywhere in the world and will not tolerate the recruitment in Nigeria of Nigerians as mercenaries to fight in Ukraine or anywhere else in the world. And the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, says that Ukraine's nuclear regulator has informed it that staff members at the plant, the largest in Ukraine, are now required to seek approval for any operation, even maintenance from Russian forces. Its director general, Rafael Grossi, says Russian forces have also switched off some mobile networks and the internet at the plant, hampering the possibility of receiving reliable information from the site through normal channels of communication. Mr. Grossi says he is extremely concerned about the developments that were reported to him today. We know, for example, that uh, there are some um, pieces of equipment that the plants need or will be needing as part of the normal operation, not necessarily of a, because of an attack or a malfunction now. In the normal course of events, had there not been a war, um, you, would, you would have that. At, and in the moment, that now, you, you have that, that supply chain is interrupted. So uh, we are already in contact with several countries 
uh, with Energoatom in this case, because it's more the side of the operator than the regulator, and we know more or less what they are needing. So, uh, but, uh, you know, there have been issues in Kharkiv, there is, there, there is an issue in uh, Mariupol, there are many places where there, there, there is no accident, there is no release of radiation, there is nothing of the sort, but, but many problems that appear here and there. Uh, this is why um, I believe that all of these are indications, uh, more than indications, confirmations, that we cannot go on like this. There has to be clear understandings or clear, clear commitments uh, not to um, go anywhere near uh, a nuclear facility when it comes to, nuclear, to military operations. And uh, the, thank you very much. Thank you. Those are portals for our live stream of our next discussion ongoing as the Russian aggression of Ukraine continues on a beta. Tech giants like Apple, Google, Meta, they've announced suspension or restriction of services in Russia. To look at the impact on this, our technology correspondent Victor Mathias is live streaming the discussion with tech experts. He joins us now. Victor, over to you. Thank you very much, Millicent, and of course, uh, welcome. It's the live stream uh, from this end, uh, coming to you from our digital studio. And I'm being joined uh, by Victor Equello. Um, he is a tech analyst and a tech um, enthusiast as well. He's joining us to look at the impact of all of the tech giants that have withdrawn their services from Russia as a result of the invasion. Victor, it's a pleasure to have you on the program today as well. Thank you very much, Victor. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, if your, your settings are kind of not too looking too good, if you could put your phone on landscape and then put the rotation settings on auto, uh, that would give us a better picture of, of you. Okay, this is also fine as well. So let's just go straight to the point. Um, you know, what is the impact? We've seen tech giants, uh, Meta, that's Facebook, uh, Google, you know, just yesterday, Visa and MasterCard have joined the long list. So many of them yeah. are putting out of Russia. What impact would it have on the people and even the economy of Russia? It, 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 it's a very interesting um, situation when, when you think about it. Um, I, I, to a very large extent, most of these things are efforts to, you know, pressure Putin, uh, you know, to back off to a very large extent. Um, but this whole service has been withdrawn. It's going to affect the citizenry more and it affects the government. It's not going to have any major effect on the government. Um, from, from 2018 to 2020, a lot of research have put the digital economy's contribution to Russia's GDP at between 3.8 to 5.3. It's like a very wide bird. And it means that like these things don't have any major impact on the Russian economy as is. Um, this morning I saw a tweet and somebody was like, oh, you know, that a Russian was like, oh, his Twitch, streaming income and PayPal just got cut off, you know, thank you, you know, that he was just being sarcastic. And I feel that to a very large extent, these bans and these withdrawals are going to affect the Russian people more than it affects the government. Um, the impact will be felt more by like digital creators, people that work in the digital economy, people that work in the gig economy, for instance, which has become a large number of people. So it is a very, it's a catch-22 situation of sorts. Like while it, it will not necessarily be a pain point for the government, it will be a pain point for the people like citizenry that work on the internet and money through this means. Um, a lot of, you know, the work, the future of work has changed largely. And for most people, the end they are living from this platform. That's a large number of people. Yeah, uh, because uh, we also saw that, I saw a tweet by KPMG saying about, uh, you know, quite a number of their staff who are working you know, in Russia would be cut off. And so, like you said, the future of work, you know, has changed and uh, yeah. most of the people now, you know, are living. So content creators, um, who else will be affected by all of this? So to a very large extent, um, you have content creators, uh, people that do YouTubers, TikTokers, um, video game streamers. Um, and you have people that work in the gig economy, people that work remotely, um, freelancers, digital marketers, software developers. And this global um, gig economy has become a large part of the global workforce today, right? And all these people are going to be affected. I'm going to be, and 
So there's no value. There's no like concrete value that exists. But every year, the global gig economy keeps expanding. So I imagine like a large swath of people under these categories that I just mentioned presently. Yeah, because I was actually, you know, going to go to that, uh, looking at, you know, how much we are looking at, you know, how much we're looking at being lost due to this yeah. uh, withdrawal of services, you know, by all of this. Because MasterCard and Visa are saying that the cards being issued, you know, in Russia will still work. Just that those cards issued in Russia will not work out outside of Russia. And of yeah. course, cards, uh, you know, issued outside of Russia won't work. So there's financial inclusion. Uh, let's even put it from that perspective now. Uh, automatically, they're cut off from the global financial institutions. Yes. Uh, yes. How, how, how much of, um, how much of, an, how much toll will it take, you know, on them? I, I, to a very large extent, I feel like this is going to destabilize a lot of people, right? Like economically speaking and career-wise. Um, there's this rumor that began circulating a while. Yes, yeah, the rumor because is all substantiated that like Russia is going to close off its internet to the rest of the world. And like there have been directives for businesses to get on the dot .ru servers, right? Get like Russian servers and whatnot. Um, and the very essence of um, the global digital economy is the decentralized nature of it. You know, the ability to transact across borders, um, you know, transact with Europe, with America. And when that goes off, it puts, again, it puts a halt to a means of livelihood to a lot of people. Um, it makes it impossible for them to get their daily livelihood to a very large extent. So like, um, there is no current estimate as to the impact of this thing yet, but I'm kind of, I'm kind of like projecting that it's going to be massive. You know, it's going to be like a huge impact again on, on the people. Because to a very large extent, not just in Russia, like globally, there, there is no concrete sizing to the digital economy, you know, to a very large extent. So most of these people are just going to suffer to a very large extent. Let me quickly, let me, let me quickly, um, you know, let's look at China, you know, that's uh, pretty yeah. much have a little bit of uh, restrictions to a certain extent. Uh, you know, they don't use uh, Meta, they don't use Twitter, you know, they pretty much created their own. Would this be um, an opportunity for, for developers in Russia to create something local? So the, the, China, the China example is very interesting. It's almost similar, but it's also not the same in a lot of ways. In that, like, China took a very long time, you know, to build out this um, very closed-out ecosystem of consumer internet, right? Um, for Russia, this isn't what is happening now. For them, it's like just wartime. It's like a reactive is like reacting to wartime, you know, needs and, you know, they're just being cut off in real time. And most of these things are not things that are built um, immediately. They take time, you know, to build out like this consumer internet infrastructure. So um, I don't know that that's what's going to happen for them because um, like a lot of the talent here are not, they are not, it's, so this is not a voluntary thing that's happening right now, basically. So I don't know that this is going to be the case with them to a very large extent. All right, we have to um, just keep tabs on everything and, you know, just keep watching and see how everything will play out. But I have to say thank you, uh, Victor Iqbalo, for joining us on the show and uh, sharing your perspective on this. Uh, of course, thank keep you, uh, tabs going. Uh, we'll, again, reach out to you when uh, we have to. But that thank said, you. from this end, of course, it's been uh, streaming live on Facebook. Um, and it is a live um, Zoom chat from Channel Television's digital uh, department. Uh, Millicent is back to you with the rest of the show. Thank you, Victor Mathias, our technology correspondent there. Uh, before we end the program, a quick look at the developments day 12 of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Moscow announced a temporary ceasefire. Of course, Kyiv has rejected it, calling it immoral. About a thousand people have been able to flee Irpin, northwest of the capital, Kyiv. Uh, we also have Ukraine saying Russian forces are targeting hospitals, nurseries and schools. Civilians have been caught up in the assault. Uh, Russia has denied targeting civilians, saying it is carrying out a special military operation and delegations Ukraine uh, and from Russia are meeting for a third round of ceasefire talks in Belarus. Uh, the UN has warned that Russia's invasion has triggered a fast-growing refugee crisis in Europe since World War II. Well, that's uh, it on the program. Uh, thank you for watching. I'm Millicent Walker. We have more updates. Our website, channelcv.com, has the latest. And the program comes your way again tomorrow at 9 a.m.